Mountain bikes come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, and no doubt one of the ones that draws the most amount of attention, of course, is the downhill bike. So today we're gonna to be checking out everything about downhill bikes and what it is about them that makes them so specialist and so different from everything else on the market. As you might imagine from the name, downhill bikes are designed to be ridden down hills, fast. So the coolest thing about these is the fact that they're designed with zero compromise. They only have to ride down hills. That means they don't need a saddle position that's efficient for climbing and efficient for many miles in the saddle. In fact, they barely need a saddle at all. It means they don't have to be super lightweight. It means they don't have to pedal as well as your cross-country bike, and it sure as hell doesn't mean that they're going to need a water bottle cage or anything like that on them. The only thing a downhill bike needs to do is get down the side of a mountain as fast as possible. And that means being able to withstand rocks, roots, jumps and bumps at insane speeds. The sort of terrain that can make other mountain bikes disintegrate. And that's why I reckon downhill bikes are the coolest mountain bikes. Now, when you look at a downhill bike, the first thing that will probably draw your attention is the fact that how aggressive they look. You've got these huge twin crown forks, much like a motorcycle on the front. The geometry is really slack, really, really relaxed. They always have mega chunky wheels and tires on them. And of course, they're very low slung and very long. They look really quite radical as far as design goes. Now, geometry on the bikes, of course, is focused entirely at getting down the side of a mountain as fast as possible. That means having a very slack head angle on the front. Now, we're talking about 63 degrees is pretty much standard for two mountain bikers now, but they can chop and change and things are adjustable, which we're gonna discuss a bit later in this video. Some mountain bikers have gone as slack as 59 degrees. Can you imagine that? This front wheel would be like hitting me in the leg if that was the case. That is bonkers slack. Now, in addition to making the handling stable when you're pointing the thing down the side of a mountain, the slack head angle actually helps the suspension work better as well. Because of the fact that the angle of the fork is further out in front of the bike, it's better in line with the bumps that you're gonna be hitting at those kind of speeds. Now, just think, if you think a bike like this looks a bit too slack and it's not gonna handle well, just imagine pointing it down the side of a hill. So it's gonna handle effectively like your bike will on the flat, except this thing's gonna be trucking it down the side of a mountain. Now, in addition to the slack front end on the bikes, you'll probably notice there's quite a long wheelbase on them. So this particular bike belongs to Neil and it's a size large, okay? So it's not even the biggest available, but you'll notice the distance between the front axle and the rear axle. I mean, look how far away the back end is. It's miles out there. So that is all about stability. As we know, longer vehicles, longer things handle better at speed than shorter things. Yeah, and at the end of the day, all these have to do is get down the side of a mountain as fast as possible. And it's not just about handling the actual speed, it's about handling on rough terrain as well. You think they're riding on choppy surfaces all the time. The shorter bike is gonna give you really erratic handling. That's why downhill bikes are always on the longer side, no matter what the size. But interestingly, it wasn't always this way. Downhill bikes from the late 90s and early 2000s were actually fairly short. And the theory behind that was that the riders could throw them around. But if you go back and look at some archive footage of downhill racers and older bikes, they just look completely out of place. You know, they're moving the body weight too far to the front and too far to the rear constantly to try and weight the wheels in order to get good grip. Modern downhill bikes are long for a reason because the pilots, as I'm gonna call them, will sit in between those two wheels, giving them the maximum amount of control and advantage over either end of the bike. It's just nuts just how different they are. In fact, I'd love to see just how fast a modern bike is like this against a bike from the 90s. I reckon that a modern like cross-country bike or a trail bike with short travel would be quicker down a hill than an old downhill bike, despite the fact they still have a lot of wheel travel on them. Now, in addition to the fact it's got long wheelbase and it's got very slack front end on the bikes, they also have adjustable geometry in a few different ways. 
The first option is something you can do up front with the suspension fork. Because of the nature of the twin crowns on them, you can actually drop those legs, so the stanchion, which is the upper leg, you can drop them and raise them slightly, um, sometimes giving up to an inch of movement depending on the size of frame and the length of head tube that the bike has and whether you have a flat crown or a dropped crown setup on there. Now, it's possible to radically change the geometry on the front end of the bike just by doing that, but all downhill bikes will have other features built into them. For example, this one has chain stay chips on them, so you can have a shorter wheelbase or a longer wheelbase. Now, for example, if you're riding a very tight and twisty course, you're gonna naturally want the bike to be a little bit shorter, so it's a bit more agile. But a flat out fast course, maybe something like Mont Saint Anne, you need the stability on your side. So it's there to be catered for. You can adjust the geometry of the bike to suit the terrain that you're gonna tackle. And there's also usually multiple shock mount positions, offering various different things from a different feel of the shock. It might tailor it from progressive feeling to linear feeling, and also the bottom bracket height of the bike as well. Now, raising and lowering the bottom bracket height on a downhill bike is actually quite an important thing. On some courses, when you're doing out and out, flat out speed, you're gonna want it a bit lower for a bit more support, and it's really good for cornering as well to keep the bike feeling planted. But if a course is exceptionally rocky and you need to be pedaling the bike, you'll be bottoming out all the time and your feet will be so close to the ground. So in that case, you're gonna to need to raise the bottom bracket. Now, this bike also has an extra thing tucked up its sleeve, as well as those adjustments I've already mentioned. You can adjust the feel of the rear suspension without it affecting the geometry of the bike. So you can set out four different ways, uh, ranging from fairly linear to really progressive. Now, linear sort of feel you're gonna want for a track that may be hard on the body, a long, rough track, for example, and really progressive, you're gonna want for something extremely rough or for something with big jumps and drops so the bike really ramps up at the end of the travel. And I already touched on it, but the fact that the saddle position is almost useless for sat down pedaling. It's more of a perch and a stability aid, if you were. So Neil's running his saddle fairly low on the bike there. Uh, depending on your preferences, rider, you might want it lower or you might want it higher. Most riders rely on the seats for putting pressure on when they're cornering, for leaning in, using your inner thigh on there and sometimes for a bit of stability when it gets really rough as well. Think of them as a perch rather than a saddle position as such. Okay, so let's move on to the suspension on a downhill bike, starting with the front fork, which has a huge twin crown design. This is essentially to support the massive amounts of wheel travel that they have. Anything over 200 millimeters is common on a downhill bike. Now, to support this amount of travel, you need to have longer legs, otherwise they just couldn't be stiff enough. So you have a twin crown design. One crown underneath the head tube, one crown on the top there, supporting those extended stanchion tubes that run all the way to the top. Now, on the inside here, this affords the designers to have more space for the air spring or the coil spring, depending on the particular design, and more space for the damper on the inside. So more space equals more oil, equals more consistency, less fade, better performance. They're designed to handle the roughest trails imaginable, and that is what they do. Now, a significant difference between uh, what you'll see on your trail bike with a single crown and these twin crown forks is your forks, if you're running a single crown, will probably have a tapered steerer tube on them. These ones have a straight steerer tube, much like older ones that you used to see. The reason you have a straight one is so it can be more adjustment of the head angle and the offset actually, adjustment of reach within the frame here. So you notice that the actual head tube of the bike is quite big. This one is 1.5 inch. They're not always this big, but they always allow for some extra adjustment. Now you can have either offset cups on the, in the frame there to actually move that steer tube forwards or backwards to effectively grow or shrink that top tube. And you can also have angled cups which can steepen and slacken anything up to two degrees, uh, which is a huge amount of adjustment. And you think that's combined with the fact that you can raise and lower the front end in these fork crowns, so you can adjust the bottom bracket height, the shock position, and the rear dropouts there to change the wheelbase. And you've got a seriously tunable bike for every course on earth. And you might also notice, instead of a conventional stem that clamps onto the steerer tube, it's quite common to have one that clamps directly onto the top crown here of the fork. Uh, kind of like a headstock you would see on a motocross bike, the same exact principle. And you can also have different adjustments of reach at the top here, so you can have different lengths of stem. I think Neil's running a 50 mil on here. That's probably about as long as you would get anything down to, well, essentially nothing, about 10 mil you see on some people's bikes that are running longer front ends on them. 
Now, as far as the setup goes, it is down to personal preference, but what you or I might run is completely different to what a top-class downhill racer is gonna run. They're gonna have their forks feeling a lot more progressive, a lot firmer, and probably having a lot more compression damping on them. And in fairness, if you were to try one in a car park, it should feel pretty horrible. The whole bike is designed to come to life at the speeds that those racers can put them through. So it's not gonna feel good at the speeds that we're gonna ride them through down through the woods over rocks and roots, because they ride in a completely different league, and accordingly, the bikes need to withstand that. Otherwise, they're just gonna crump when a heap on the floor. On the back of a downhill bike, you have a much bigger shock. And it's very commonplace, like on this bike, to see a coil sprung shock. Now, whether the rider chooses to have a coil sprung or an air sprung shock, they have a huge amount of adjustability built into them. You're talking about low speed and high speed compression, low speed and high speed rebound. That's four significant adjustments there. In addition to this, you can often adjust the boost pressure in the piggyback system as well to really increase the bottom out resistance. Downhill shocks operate at a much higher frequency, which means they're gonna get hotter quicker, which means you can lead to inconsistent feeling damping if the oil is gonna get hot enough that the viscosity changes that's why you see a piggyback design on shocks like this. It's essentially to enable much more oil and better oil flow on the inside of the shock. Now, Outback, you're looking at around 200 millimeters on average, some bikes less, some bikes more, some up to a massive 250 millimeters, uh, which just sounds crazy. Now, typically you'll have an adjustable feel on the bikes, ranging from linear to progressive, and not much in the way of anti-squat, as it's not really needed. A high anti-squat, like 100%, is good for cancelling out pedaling effect on suspension, but high anti-squat also means the suspension tends to feel less sensitive. Less anti-squat means more traction and more feel. That is the more important necessity on the downhill bike. Bottom bracket standards, as you might have noticed on this bike, it's got an incredibly wide bottom bracket shell. You're talking 83 millimeters here, which is some 10 mil wider than your regular trail bikes. The wide pivots on the bike need a lot of stability. You need a wide stance when you're stood on the bike for lots of control. They always tend to have short cranks as well. Pedaling on a downhill bike, of course it is a necessity. However, with 200, well, upwards of 200 millimeters of travel on the bikes, ground clearance is a significant problem. So cranks around 165 millimeters are fairly typical. Whereas on your regular trail and cross country bikes, you'll tend to see cranks around the 170 to 175 millimeter region. Now, as you might notice on the back here, there's not a lot going on in the way of gears. Now, some bikes have as little as seven gears on the back, and you'll notice they've got very close ratio cassettes much like those you see on road bikes. Having gears that are very close together is really important, so the downhill racers know what gear they're in at any point on the course. If you were to come out of a turn with a regular cassette and accidentally have been two or three gears wrong either way, you might not be able to pedal at the speed you need to immediately. You'll always see a chain guide on the front. The upper guide, as you might imagine, is simply there to keep the chain onto that chain ring. The lower guide isn't quite as essential, but it actually has a bigger effect in that it's doubled up as a bash guard. Now this is really essential for both protection of the bike to enable the bike to slide over big things like rocks and roots, which it will sump out on, on course, and also to protect the chainring. If you destroy the chainring on your race run, you're not gonna be able to pedal and that could cost you a win. Again, the whole point of a downhill bike is to get down the side of a mountain as fast as possible. Brakes are just as important on downhill bikes as any other bike. It's just the fact you've got to slow down for much higher speeds on a very inconsistent terrain. Now downhill brake levers tend to offer a little bit more mechanical advantage to a lightweight cross country levers. And they pretty much always have four piston calipers, sometimes six, which we have seen on certain race bikes. There'll be 200 millimeter rotors front and rear, sometimes as big as 220. Things are changing slightly as the bikes are getting quicker and using bigger wheels. Now the brake rotors as well are also slightly thicker. Due to the fact they're that much bigger, they need to be stiffer and also help dissipate the heat. So they, they vary from 1.8 millimeters thick up to 2.3, which you tend to see on the much bigger 220 mil rotors. Now sometimes rotors have additional things to assist with brake cooling and heat dissipation. 
You sometimes see finned pads, which are essentially like heat sinks to draw the heat away from the pad surface. And also two piece rotor designs that have alloy spiders with a steel braking track surface. Again, the alloy spider helps pull the heat off that steel braking surface. The lower the temperature your brakes can work out, the more consistent they're gonna feel. It's all about consistency with downhill bikes. And finally, wheel size. Now, 26 was always the common option back in the day. They were small, they were strong, but unfortunately, as things started progressing, it started showing the fact that they couldn't handle the bumps in the same way as bigger 27 and half and 29 inch wheel bikes. The rollover is simply much better on them. Now, 27.5 was adopted quite quick, but 29 inch wasn't for everyone to start with, but really, it's starting to come in by storm now. However, it's still not for everyone. Mixed wheel size on race bikes is actually quite a common thing, uh, in particular for smaller riders that need a bit more clearance. When you've got a wheel moving as much as 200 millimeters on the back end, a 29 inch wheel can buzz you uh, as you bottom out, buzz you on the bum. So actually, some riders really do need to benefit from a smaller size wheel to give you the clearance to ride it the way that they need to ride. Tire design as well, they're all about maximum traction. Now only on very few tracks would a faster or firmer compound be considered. Now the tread design is absolutely crucial. Depending on the style of course you're gonna be on, they're gonna have a variety of different depths of tread. For example, a mud course might have a spike tire, much like something you'll see on a motocross bike, whereas a very dry course will have a lower stack height tire. Downer tires have a fairly standard open style tread. The shoulders will be very aggressive, again, in a similar vein to motocross bikes, and they're there really to help carve that edge into the hillside in a similar way to how you could say the edge on a snowboard would work. They also have to have a braking tread and an intermediate tread on them. So the braking tread will be so you can load the tire up into the terrain and really scrub off speed. And the intermediate tread is between that central tread and the shoulders. Uh, you could call it a transitional tread because it needs to have the consistency when you're starting to lean the bike over on terrain. Now there's different casing available as well compared to your trail tires, enduro tires and cross country tires. Now cross country tires will tend to be single ply and very lightweight. Downhill tires can be four ply. That is like four layers of rubber essentially in that casing. They're very thick and they quite often have beautiful inserts in the actual sidewalls as well. This aids both stability of the tire and also resistance against pinch punctures, which despite setting them up tubeless, you can still get pinch punctures on downhill tires because you can actually split the tire due to the vast impact force that you can get when hitting rough terrain. Now, sometimes riders will use inserts on the inside. Uh, this helps keep the tires on to a degree and also helps prevent those pinch punctures. Now, not all riders will use this. It does depend on the tire pressures preferred, the tire brand that the rider's using, and indeed, the way that the rider actually rides the terrain. Now, with axle standards, again, it's not too different on downhill bikes. Uh, around 157 on rear ends, it does tend to vary depending on what's going on with the brand, but nice and wide for stability and strength on the back end. Big bracing angle for the spokes. Front end, not too much different, 110 mil, just like you see on most trail bikes these days. There you go, that is a downhill bike, extremely cool. Love the fact that everything on them is designed to be optimal for tackling downhill terrain. Super cool. What do you think of downhill bikes? Have you got one? Would you have one? And what bike do you want me to talk about next? Uh, let us know in those comments. See you in the next video.